It is Wednesday, September 30th. What can do not deserve Wego and Joe Delronio Jets. And this is our 135th Kahnawake COVID-19 task force update. As uh, we all know, it has been a very busy few days, very dramatic uh, turns of events. Announcements have been made, decisions are made, and we are moving along. Just before we start, I uh, just wanted to mention that, of course, today is Orange Shirt Day as we uh, commemorate those who uh, lived and survived the uh, residential school era. And uh, we, we commend those people and uh, hopefully nothing like that will ever, ever happen again. On today's program, Lloyd Phillips will be here. We'd like to start off, though, with uh, Lisa Westaway, who is the Executive Director of the Cattery Memorial Hospital Centre and a member of the COVID-19 Task Force. Lisa? Good afternoon. Um, so uh, we had a task force meeting this afternoon and uh, we would like to um, officially advise the community that as of uh, tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. we will uh, officially be moving our alert level into the red zone. Um, so I'm here to explain a little bit about uh, why we are moving into the red zone and then Lloyd will give you a little bit more details about what that means exactly. So, um, uh, as you recall, the elements that we have used, uh, the elements we have, are you, everything okay? Yeah. The elements we have used to, uh, to, to indicators we use, sorry, I'm, being, I'm a little bit distracted. So, the indicators we use to uh, define how we move through the phases are the number of cases, the percentage of uh, positive cases per number of cases tested, as well as our ability to contact trace uh, within 24-hour period. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the elements that we're seeing in Quebec and then I'll uh, refer back to Gunawage. So as you recall when uh, businesses started to reopen in Quebec we were looking for an R effective rate under one. So our effective rate means the number of people or the percentage number of people that can be uh, that the virus can be transmitted to with one positive case. So when we reopened business um, across Quebec we were at under uh, one, we were at about 0.7 and um, as of today we're at an our effective rate of 1.37. So this number is consistently rising. Also, uh, we uh, of course see the number of cases doubling on a regular basis throughout Quebec. Uh, the number, uh, the percentage of positive cases, as uh, you know, the number that we looked at for um, healthy, I would say, transmission of the virus, so a percentage that allows us to ensure that we can control what's happening around us and that we have enough hospital beds to be able to maintain uh, those who are um, hospitalized. Uh, we wanted to be at 2%. Uh, so as of today, the rate in Quebec is at 5.5%. This is very high. So what does that indicate to us? It indicates that uh, there are, that we are not able to test enough um, and that there is a high probability that there are many more positive cases within the environment than what are presently being identified through testing. Um, so we also, uh, the third is contact tracing. So when we talk about contact tracing, being able to contact trace within 24 hours, the idea is once you identify a case, identify the contacts, ensure that they self-isolate so that you're minimizing the risk of transmission. If you don't do that very quickly, then you're unable to minimize risk and you have many people who are poten potentially infected who are walking around and transmitting the virus and so on and so forth. So um, right now, um, although um, Quebec is still able to contact trace. They are no longer able to do that within 24 hours. So there is a backlog at the public health level. But not only that, there is a back, a serious backlog at uh, the testing level. So the ability to, um, to provide results 
quick enough so that you can contact trace also quickly. Um, so that's what's happening in Quebec. If we look at Gunawaga in particular, we know that uh, there are elements we have control over. We have our own testing site. So again, I would like to tell the community it's important if you need to be tested that you get tested at our testing site. Why at our testing site? Because we do get results more quickly than if you get tested elsewhere. So we would suggest that you come to our testing site. So we um, are seeing that we have positive cases. We have five positive cases as I mentioned yesterday. We have not received any new results and so uh, we cannot determine at this time if we have any more positive cases. Um, we have five positive cases. That percentage uh, on the total number of cases is quite high. Of course, we're in a smaller community, so we don't only look at percentage of positive cases. Um, but if we compare that with what's happening in Quebec at 5.5, that tells us that um, there is a possibility of community transmission. There is a possibility of other cases in the community that we are not necessarily identifying at this time. Um, we also know that um, being such a small interconnected community that we are very vulnerable. We've talked about this often since the beginning of the pandemic and we really see that in the way transmission happens and how it's happened in our more recent uh, clusters of cases. And again, this is just facts. This is nothing, uh, this is not about uh, finger pointing or blaming. This is factual for all of us. We are all in a situation where we have various contacts. We showed you that in the bubble yesterday that we showed on the picture that we showed on Facebook Live, um, that what we think our bubble is and what it actually is, is much wider. And that probably is the case for each and every one of us. Um, and so we see that when there is a positive case, that the likelihood of transmission to many contacts is, uh, is high. Um, we also see that um, we see that there's a possibility because of all the factors that I've mentioned that there are other cases in the community and therefore uh, the unpredictability of this means that we feel it's necessary to move to a state of red alert. Uh, this allows us to have a little bit more control over our environment um, and, uh, and containing the virus as much as possible um, and we will have Lloyd on next to who will explain a little bit what that means. Um, so Lloyd, I'm going to pass it to you. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you for inf information. And certainly, it's been a very uh, busy week at the task force. Uh, very stressful week, to be quite honest with you. Uh, and uh, you know, a lot of um, a tough decision had to be made in a very short uh, period of time. Uh, but before I, I get into that, I also want to acknowledge the fact that, uh, you know, it is Orange Shirt Day. Uh, this is uh, the closest thing to uh, orange I have in, 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 my, in my, uh, my wardrobe, and I didn't have time to go out and purchase something that was, that was more orange than what I'm wearing. You know, because certainly it talks about, you know, every child matters, uh, which is, is obviously one reason why I'm standing up here today. And certainly, as just as much as every child matters, you know, every elder matters uh, as well. Many of our elders who lived through the residential school era. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that as well. Uh, and based on what Lisa had just outlined and some of the situations that's across the Quebec and some of the many unknowns, uh, we believe that Quebec has lost control of the containment of the virus. And therefore, uh, they have decided to move um, Greater Montreal into, into the greater area, uh, Greater Montreal into the red uh, alert area, and as such, uh, with all the elements within our community and taken into consideration, obviously we had to uh, consider very uh, quickly if we move to red, and the short answer to that was yes, uh, we must uh, to protect our community in the best possible way we can. Now, no, what I, what I have to talk about next, I certainly do not take pleasure in, in having to, to speak about. It does bring me back to uh, remembering uh, what we discussed in, in March and in April 
uh, and unfortunately, you know, it's some area that we have to uh, revisit uh, once again. Uh, things have evolved very quickly uh, within uh, the province, Montreal area, and in within Ganawage, and you know, this is forcing us to take actions uh, to mitigate as much as possible uh, the uh, impacts of COVID-19 in our community. I'll run through a list of, of a few items that was discussed and decided today at the um, task force level. Uh, but what I'll start off by saying is we do have um, that document which we shared publicly on you know, green, yellow, orange, and red. And in, in the red area, there are a list of several items that, um, that can be done. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that everything within the red zone is done immediately. Uh, no, there, there could be areas in there that, that could be phased in over a period of days or, or weeks. Uh, we are hopeful that by taking some initial measures, uh, we won't have to uh, further uh, move down that, 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 that path uh, to having uh, more restrictions. So uh, we're balancing out whatever we can to try to uh, you know, achieve that holistic approach, uh, trying to balance off of the social well-being of our community, economic well-being of our community, spiritual, and of course, physical well-being. is something that we have tried uh, very hard over the past uh, uh, many months. But I'll start off with, with uh, uh, one regarding uh, travel. Uh, and we had several questions about this today, and as we did with the orange alert, um, the travel advisory is in effect. Uh, you are, there are travel um, restrictions between region to region. Uh, it is highly recommended that uh, you do not go outside uh, the, the region in which you live. And these regions, I'm speaking of in general terms, and that's uh, what Quebec and Montreal and, and, and Montérégie and those various regions, uh, uh, Quebec has, has, has imposed that about travel restrictions uh, in, in those areas. At this point, there is no physical um, barriers from go somebody from going from one region to the next, but the, it, is, it is highly discouraged. And more locally, uh, we are asking people to stay uh, local as much as possible. We understand people have business to take care of, um, and um, no, this is somewhat sudden. So yes, take care of what you need to take care of, but we're asking people as, as much as possible, uh, stay uh, local. And uh, as well, no, talking about the, the regional uh, travel, uh, the, talking about the, uh, the Jowarodo uh, territory, um, that we um, had several questions about people asking if um, they can travel you know, to Jowarodo to either go hunting or to close their, uh, their, uh, their cabins. Uh, and yes, there is no uh, restrictions on that uh, physically, but obviously we're asking people uh, to remain safe. We understand that uh, Joe the territory, although it's in a different region, uh, is a, a second home to, to many Ganawagadono. So that is uh, uh, permissible. Uh, effective uh, tomorrow as well, they'll be um, ceasing uh, any visitation at the Turtle Bay Elder Lodge, uh, um, um, the independent living services at, at the, the ILC, uh, as well as uh, uh, Turtle, Bay, uh, Turtle Bay Elder Lodge and Cattery Hospital Center. And some of the ones I'm sure people are, are, are concerned about uh, and the impacts on individuals is uh, relating to businesses uh, and what is going to be implemented effective on uh, actually to say to be clear a 1201 Sunday morning which is basically midnight on uh, Saturday that businesses uh, in the following areas uh, will have to uh, cease uh, operations or modify operations. Uh, restaurants will need to close their dining areas. They will have to move to takeout or delivery services only. The cigar lounges in the community, so unfortunately who have just recently opened, uh, will be required uh, to close, as well as the, um, the gaming establishments in the community uh, will also be required to close as of uh, 12.01 a.m. on Sunday morning. Uh, the rationale behind these establishments is um, the, there is a, um, a gathering component to it. 
where people have um, have to come together and, and, and there's a large amount of people and, 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 a, and a relatively uh, sh short proximity to one another where it ha has been proven that that has been the, um, the source of the majority of the transmission uh, of the virus happening either at, at private or, or public gatherings. So these are the uh, businesses that will be impacted by the recent directives uh, in order to help protect our community. No, all other businesses will remain uh, operational. Uh, there will be enhanced inspections. We do call upon business owners and managers and employees to be extra vigilant in terms of making sure that the measures that have been in place since June are, are uh, complied with, are enforced to ensure that we don't have to uh, go down that path of, of having further closures uh, in the community. Uh, with the physical barriers that are in place with them, uh, and, and the relatively short interactions in the retail establishment, you know, the, uh, we are hopeful that the, in these measures uh, will be enough to slow uh, the spread of the virus. Uh, regarding the schools, Robin Delarone, the director of the Gunawag Education Center, will be here tomorrow to give much more detail, but they are going to be moving um, as quickly as possible to uh, remote learning. Uh, taking into consideration many aspects uh, to assist people one-on-one uh, -on -one or the vulnerable population as need be. But she'll be we'll here tomorrow to speak on that in, in great detail. And along the same lines, uh, let people know that um, the busing service in the community for children who go outside Gunawage will not be impacted. That service uh, will continue. Uh, regarding public gatherings, uh, public gatherings are going to be uh, not allowed or prohibited uh, with the exception of uh, certain areas that may require, uh, you know, for various uh, reasons such as funerals, uh, religious purposes, ceremonial purposes, uh, no psychosocial support services in the community, and some, there may be some others that may be subject on, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but that is something that we... Uh, we feel is extremely important at this point in time because we are at that very vulnerable and very critical state uh, in our community. Uh, there is at this point um, no um, stay at home directive. That is something that you may see that that's on the, re the red zone, but uh, that is something we're hoping, like, like I said, these measures uh, currently being taken uh, is uh, not, uh, will be enough to, to slow uh, the spread of the virus. So the, rather than having immediately going to a stay-at-home directive and a household-only directive, uh, we are still saying that we want, will allow for private gatherings in your home, as we did last week, to a maximum of six people, provided that that space uh, can be accommodated and that the safety measures are in place. Uh, we're trying to be uh, and balance off as many things as we can uh, and we feel and by allowing for uh, people to, to still um, uh, associate with uh, f friends or loved ones uh, is important, again, to, to the well-being of, of uh, everybody involved. Uh, so we do have that limitation at maximum of six people. And we're hoping, again, uh, that we'll, we'll be able to remain as is for, for, uh, for the long term. But if need be... Uh, any one of these measures uh, would need to be uh, reconsidered or, or looked at uh, more closely. Uh, organized sports in the community uh, will have to cease operations immediately. Uh, that would refer to any organized sports, uh, whether it be uh, uh, amateur uh, or, or, or um, uh, excuse me, for, for youth or, or for adults. Uh, those activities are to cease uh, effective immediately. Uh, individual sports uh, no, could maintain uh, as though no, they're obviously it's, it's, it's much safer, there's no contact and, and it can be done uh, in, in a, a very safe manner. The community organizations uh, who have been operating for the most part on essential services only uh, will also uh, be asked to revisit what they're currently doing to uh, reassess what is um, essential. 
uh, for them to maintain services to the community, to maintain their operations, uh, and essential to ensure that the uh, community uh, itself uh, keeps operating, but the community continues to operate in a very uh, safe manner. So, no, these are some of the elements that need to be implemented. implemented. Some of them are immediately, and some will be phased in, as I mentioned, with the businesses effective on Sunday at 12.01 a.m. And uh, things will continue to be assessed as we move forward. So now that we have officially moved into um, the red phase, we're also reaching out to the community uh, for your understanding that uh, no, we're all in this together. Uh, it's a very, very trying time uh, for everybody, uh, including members of the task force. Uh, like I said, up, up top and front, you know, we don't take these measures lightly. Uh, we don't take no pleasure in asking businesses or telling businesses they have to cease operations. We take no pleasure in, in stopping gatherings, but we're doing it uh, with the best intent for our community to protect the children and protect the elders and protect everybody. So there will be more information coming through press releases. There is another Facebook Live tomorrow. Uh, where we begin this information out uh, in more detail as we go. Uh, but these are the key points that will be released in a press release in the coming, um, coming hours or so. So with that, I'll turn it back to Joe and uh, take care, everybody, and uh, see you soon. Ani Thank you. All right, so again, pretty, uh, pretty dramatic uh, events, turn of events here in Gahnawagi, but not only in Gahnawagi, but across Canada and uh, around the world. Remember now, over a million people have died around the world. In the United States, it's 200,000, and uh, in Canada, actually, it's approaching, you know, some, some big numbers as well. So we have to be careful. We have to stay diligent. But we're, we're doing well. We just have to stay the course. Uh, just some, uh, another uh, bit of uh, information. Today, the Mohawk Council of Gahnawaga issued a release uh, talking about the problem of uh, shaming, finger pointing, blaming, and all of that. Uh, I'd suggest if you get a chance to read that, uh, take a look at it because we actually have to support people who have contracted uh, COVID-19 and not be uh, yelling at them and pointing fingers like we said. We all have to support each other. We're all in this together. We continue to do well. It's scary, but we got through the first wave. Let's all work together to make sure we get through the second wave. So again, lots of uh, developments. Look for the press release. It should be issued shortly. There are many new developments, and there will be more in the days to come. We thank you so much for taking time to join us uh, this afternoon. And uh, stay well, everyone. On behalf of everybody at the COVID-19 Task Force, Nyao Koa Dano Onigiwahi.